Hello and a very warm welcome to you all. I'm Vikas Nangia with Focus Live Season 4. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest today on the program is a leading stand-up comedian, popularly known as Funny Indian. My guest on the program is Rajiv Satyal. Rajiv, thank you so very much for joining us on Focus Live Season 4. Thank you for having me. Namaste, namaskar. Good to be with you. Look, this was long due. I'd been wanting to have you on the program from Season 2. We are here now in Season 4. And uh, what really, to the viewers, I'd really like to tell them that what uh, really pushes me to bring Rajiv, although he's here in the country in the United States, he's joining us from the West Coast, I'm here in the East Coast, but what really pushes me to bring uh, him on the show right away is Oscars 2022. Rajiv, um, for years to come, you know, Oscars 2022 will be uh, the topic of discussion. Uh, the way Will Smith walked on the stage and slapped Chris Rock, that was just unbelievable. Now, as a, as a stand-up comedian, as a stage artist, what is your take? Look, we knew that apologies would be forthcoming from Chris Rock and Will Smith. You know, if you take the word slap and you spell it backwards, it's pals, mm -hmm. right? So we know that they're going to be friends, they're going to move on. But the damage to comedy is done. So if people are looking for a lot of jokes about this, hey, there are a lot of jokes. One of my favorite ones out there was, hey, what is that on Chris Rock's face? Fresh prints. You know what? We can make jokes. That's the whole idea. Because if we don't laugh at those jokes, the whole mess of where we got here was we can make this joke. We can't make that joke. But what I have to say today, a lot of this might not be very funny because it's very serious to comedians. Comedians right. are being persecuted, prosecuted, whether it's in India, whether it's in the United States, all over the world. And people are attacking the people who are making the jokes. They're not attacking the actual problems. We're the ones out there calling out the problems and we're the ones who are becoming the problem. And I just don't think that's fair. Well, let me ask you this, Rajiv. Um, where Will Smith felt offended was that, uh, you know, when he went, uh, when Chris Rock went a bit personal, and, uh, you know, when I'm reading uh, the articles, it says that it was not even scripted. He went off script when he mentioned about his wife. Uh, well, I'm sure he was not aware of her health condition. And, you know, that really uh, made him feel bad, especially, um, you know, when Will Smith's wife was looking down, he couldn't really take that. Uh, and he walked on the stage and you know what? Till the time he was really walking onto the stage, I thought it is all scripted. I never, I never imagined that, you know, when he will, after slapping Chris Rock, when he will come back on his seat and he will use the F word, I, till then I was like, man, this, this all sounds as if it was scripted. But then I was really shocked. Now the question over here is, you know, as a stand-up comedian, you know, I also feel that shouldn't he be more responsible that he should not be really talking much about his personal life? Forget about much. He shouldn't be talking about his personal life. Well, look, it's a matter of taste. And, and free speech includes bad taste, right? And that's the thing. It, it includes the right to offend. And there is really no right, as Ricky Gervais likes to remind us, the comedian from England, you do not have the right to not be offended, right? So what ends up happening with comedy is it's very democratic. You know, the marketplace of ideas will shoot you down via silence, via booze, via hisses, via people walking out, by, via people not buying more tickets to your shows. So you will be punished in the marketplace of capitalism, of democracy, the way that these things work. But to have yourself personally attacked, we can get to that in a minute, as far as whether he should have made the joke. Look, that's the problem. And in therapy, you know, say, they seem don't like that you admit that you go to therapy. You know, that you just go to your aunties and uncles for therapy. <laughs> but, you know, they don't like to share that we actually sit down with a, with a psychiatrist or psychologist or therapist. But look, the reality of it is 
it, you, what you hear all the time in therapy is there is no should, there is no supposed to, right? It is just whatever is tolerated. And if we limit free speech, it, it is, and I don't like the, to use the term slippery slope because it, slippery slope is the enemy of compromise, right? We always have to give a little bit to get a little bit and you meet in the middle and those sorts of things. But we are, it is not up to us to tell comedians what they should and should not cover. It's whatever you can get away with because people make all sorts of jokes that are just right on the line. And it's the comedians that are taking those proverbial bullets and, and real slaps in real time. I mean, it was soldiers that fought for freedom. My uh, my nanny, actually my, my uh, mom's dad and my dad's dad both fought in the Indian army in World War II. And so back then they were fighting for people's freedoms. Now I'm not going to equate comedians to soldiers unless you're Vladimir Zelensky and you're actually on the front lines as a former comedian and current soldier. But we're the ones who are actually taking those proverbial bullets so that people can have free speech. So whether or not he should, look, if he got laughs, it works. That's what always happens. As a comedian, you'd be like, hey, I'm really funny. On the nights that you get a lot of laughs, you have a leg to stand on. The nights that you don't get laughs, so you say, I'm funny, people are like, not tonight. And it varies. Well, on the Chris Rock side, I believe he did not retaliate the, uh, you know, on the stage. I think he, he reacted to the whole situation in a very... Yes, he was shocked, but he reacted to the whole situation very, very maturely in a very subtle way. He continued uh, anchoring the show and that just shows his professionalism. I think uh, that I must give uh, some brownie points to Chris Rock for that. But I, I certainly, uh, you know, reserve my comments that, you know, whether or not he should have uh, spoken anything about Will Smith's uh, personal life. Well, also, I want to get your reaction on Will, uh, Will Smith, you know, when he had gone for accepting the Oscars at that point of time, he apologized the Academy, but he didn't mention any apology to Chris Rock. Now, that's another thing, uh, you know, that people are talking about. Absolutely, as well as they should, because that would be the first thing that you would think of is the person you actually assaulted deserves an apology or at least some kind of mention. Which and he did say, later on social platform. He There he specifically took his name that I apologize, Chris, for his behavior, but not while, ex, uh, you know, his in his acceptance speech uh, for the Academy Award. His whole speech was phony. You know, actors can cry on cue a lot of the time. And in the whole thing, he tried to justify it like his character. Look, I'm an actor. You haven't seen me in a lot of things. So I'm more of an auditioner because, but look, here's the thing, right? I, I act like an actor. That's about it. But no, sometimes I've booked a couple of small things here and there. And, and the thing is you, you, you summon your, your talent and your skill as an actor to portray a character. Well, that's fine. A character is taking place on a stage or in a film and a series, whatever you want to call it, but you're still you. And that's what you bring to the table. And that's really important to understand that he tried to mix it all up and justify that love makes you do crazy things and okay sure love makes you do crazy things that's fine but don't do stupid things so the artist community be it in hollywood be it in bollywood uh, many individuals have condemned uh, this uh, you know behavior of uh, of will smith and i guess in times to come uh, as i said you know uh, there's so much to learn from this and I'm sure Academy, although they've said that they look into the matter, but we know if, if both these individuals have uh, just come to the common grounds and they have agreed, they are just, they've just moved on, um, I don't know what the outcome will be, but I, I'm sure there will be some major disclaimers uh, coming from Academy in years to come. You are probably right about that. I think, you know, it's a lot of time with the SAG negotiations, Screen Actors Guild every few years, there will be all these negotiations and the average Joe on the street will say, you know, well, who cares? They're a bunch of rich Tom Cruises. Well, no, it actually affects a lot of working actors, friends of ours, neighbors of ours who, look, they book a few things, but they need to book those roles. Those negotiations mean a lot to them. So who will get hurt will be the everyday comedians that now the audiences will feel like, well, you know, you can punch a person, you can slap a person, you can shoot a person, who knows what it can happen because today's slap becomes tomorrow's gunshot. We have to be very careful of that. And brown people are not given this kind of leverage, right? I mean, I made the point in a piece that I wrote on my Substack, which is if Joseph Patel had attacked Riz Ahmed, right? They would have been escorted out probably Absolutely. with undertones of Absolutely. terrorism or any other charges or whatever, or these brown guys are crazy and whatever. It's right now, White folks, uh, you know, have, have mistreated black folks for so long in this country that the pendulum is swinging the other way. We need it to swing. I'm a strong proponent of the black movement. I'm an ally of the movement. 
at the same time, now people are feeling like they're walking on eggshells and eggshells are white anyway, but we feel like we cannot say anything to the black community. Well, it's not that way with the Asian community, whether that's South or East Asian community or Desis or anyone else, we're not granted that same kind of latitude. So there's not a lot of funny stuff to say in there right now. Right. It's still very raw, but at the same time, it's uh, it's it's a scary, it's, it's a scary place that not only where we're headed, but where we are but also where we are. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. Uh, had there been an issue with any brown um, uh, you know, actor on the stage or anybody had committed something like this, you know, of course, the police would have escorted them out by now. And this would have been much bigger news than uh, what it is right now uh, between uh, Will Smith and Chris Rock. Um, you mentioned about uh, Riz Ahmed. I mean, uh, his um, uh, receiving the award uh, says a lot as well. Um, how would you react to that? You know, I'm very honored and privileged to say that he and I used to hang out quite a bit back in the day. It was really something when he got to LA, a mutual friend of ours, Anik, had put us in touch. And, you know, we hung out, I think, four nights in a row. I took him around, introduced him to people. He came to my first solo show in right. 2013 called No Man's Land. He sat in the front row, brought people. He came this next night, too. We went to dinner, and he gave me notes. And he was like, hey, maybe, have you thought about doing this? Because I do a chronicle chronological take on my dating life. And that right. actually led very directly to my, to my marriage. And he said, OK. Okay, I know you go chronologically. We're sitting across from each other at dinner. But what if you went sort of like your different attributes, like how you're a little bit effeminate, how you were short, how you were bald, how you so were- So he gave you all those inputs. Wow. He gave me all those inputs. We sat for about an hour and I said, Riz, you know what's so funny is that's originally how I wrote it, more as like stand up, But then I turned it so that it was more of a narrative. And he goes, can you turn it back? I go, well, imagine you have a house. And I know I'm explaining this to a, a very good actor, but I go, you have a house and it's working, the plumbing, the electrical. You're asking me to basically turn my house on its side, 90 degrees, and making sure the plumbing, the electrical is still working. It's going to be very hard to do that. He goes, I think it might be worth it. I go, it's hard to be insightful and funny at the same time. He goes, no, but you've got it, bruv. You can do it, bruv. I think you can do it. Right. And in subsequent shows after that, I've taken his advice. And I think it has helped, not necessarily with that first show, but going forward with my shows about music and politics and whatever else. So I wish him well. And I was thrilled to see that somebody I knew so well and with whom I'd been in cars and at dinner was there uh, doing big things for Desi's man. Got to give a shout out to, the, to uh, Riz Ahmed for that. Absolutely. A big shout out to the, uh, Riz Ahmed for, you know, receiving the award. As a matter of fact, I do recall some great moments with him. I remember, um, you know, interviewing him for Reluctant Fundamental Mira Nair's movie, you know, and um, just before the interview and after the interview, we got the moment to interact with each other. So it was great interacting. As a matter of fact, just about a few days ago, a few weeks ago, his new movie released, and I'm forgetting the name right now, it released a, a sci-fi movie released on Amazon. I had the opportunity of interviewing him around that time. As Real? Well. It's very short, the name. Right. Yes. It, it, it's a very short name, you're right, and it's just, it's just not coming to my mind right now, but I remember Reluctant Fundamentalist um, as of now because that was the moment when we really stood for a while and interacted with each other. Well... We're going to take a quick short break over here, uh, Rajiv. On the other side of the break, I want to talk about some of your um, other achievements. To me, yes, you are Punjabi guy to the world, but for me, you are a Punjabi guy. We'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back. You're watching Focus Live Season 4. Ladies and gentlemen, I am having some wonderful conversation with Rajiv Satyal. And as I said prior to the break to the world, he's a Punjabi guy. For me, he is a Punjabi guy. Uh, Rajiv, uh, thank you so very much for joining us again. You know, to the best of my knowledge, what I recall that it's been over two decades that you've been uh, performing on stage all over United States, in India, as a matter of fact, all across, uh, all over the world, you know, I've been to several countries. Um, and each time I see your stage performance, um, whether your stand-up comedy acts or you emceeing, uh, you know, several fundraisers for nonprofit organization, you seem to be getting better every other time in your skill set. Uh, so, so congratulations to you for that. But talk about this long journey of yours, you know, you've covered it all, man, from pop culture to politics. And that says a lot about you as a stand-up comedian. 
Well, I really appreciate your kind words. Uh, shukriya. Thank you so much for that. That's very, very nice. A uh, fun jobby. I'm going to have to take that with me. I always say that the reason I make a lot of wordplay is I'm a pun jobby because, you know, I do a lot of puns. So why right. not throw that in the mix? But I like fun jobby as well. That's really great. So, you know, yeah, it has been a journey. And Jerry Seinfeld had talked about how stand up comedy was a journey into oneself. And what's interesting about stand-up comedy, even furthermore, if you can improve upon Seinfeld, which is difficult to do, it's, it's a public journey into oneself. So you are seeing that, my parents are seeing that, my friends are seeing that, the development over time. What is the next topic you want to cover? What is the next exploration? What is the next front? And it's fun to do that, you know, to be able to bring your, your prepared material to the stage, but then also hopefully be able to interact with the audience. I love doing that. I love being able to stay in the moment and MC. And I oftentimes tell people that that's kind of what you're paying for more. It's not even so much the, the existing material, but I love reacting to stuff in the moment. And to your point about Chris Rock earlier, that's what I think was so insane about how he was able to stay composed and keep his poise during a shocking time at the 2022 Oscars for him to stand and almost keep his feet planted and go right into the next line. You know, he's my number one of all time. I'll send you a picture of him and me from a long time ago. But wow. that was amazing to me. And I look at look up to those professionals, people who are professional MCs, professional comedians, and learn from them because there's a lot to learn. Speaking about learning, you know, obviously to be a good stand-up comedian, you have to be an observationist. Um, what is it that you look around? What is it that you observe around and you put it into an act of yours? And how much time really it takes you to put together you know, the, the scripting, although you go very impromptu in your performances, I've seen, you know, you interact with your audiences as well. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there's a, there's some sort of a structure to to your performances, this to the, uh, you know, the acts that you do. Uh, just walk us through a bit about your creative process, the observations you do uh, that you, you know, that you sort of uh, take in consideration and bring them together in your performances. The late, great George Carlin, whom I met for a very brief second, I was down in the Comedy and Magic Club or near the Comedy and Magic Club in Hermosa Beach, one of the greatest comedy clubs in the world. And I happened to walk into it. I don't live anywhere near there. I live on the other side of Los Angeles. And I happened to walk into the club and I performed there many times. Hmm. And it happened to be Russell Peters opening for George Carlin. Wow. Amazing, right? What a night to just walk in. And I'm walking down the hall and there comes George Carlin towards me. And I go, hi, he goes, hey, and that's it. People go, that's all you said to him. I go, you don't expect to see George Carlin walking towards you. I didn't know he was on the show and all this. I went back to the green room and Russell's there and it was just an insane time. And Carlin was about to go to the stage. I didn't get much of a chance to talk to him afterwards, but at least I got to say hi to one of my idols. You know, I don't think I can improve upon what Carlin's advice was, which is at the time, and then he moved this to a computer, to Word documents, and now the basis is like, okay, now let me listen to what he's talking about. I'm going to talk about technical stuff. So he said that he had three notebooks mm -hmm. that later became Word docs, but the first notebook was all of his raw ideas, just no filter, no judgment, just almost journaling where you get an idea and you write it down, you commit it to paper. It's okay to type it or this kind of type for the youngsters. They're like, what is this? I'm like this. And that's how old I am, by the way, I use the term youngsters. So that's the first notebook. Then what he does or did respectfully, he moved to the second notebook, which was the stuff that he was working on. It was a work in progress. And it was, it was you know, if the first notebook was very long, this one was a little bit shorter, of course, it's stuff that he's working on. And that has a large, you know, kind of like just barely doing to almost finish. And then this third notebook was his HBO special, was his late night set. This is finally carved in stone. And so he would try to take his ideas and get them to migrate from the first to the second to the third notebook. And of course, it's a filter. It's not going to make all all of it in your, your raw thoughts, 80% of anybody's raw thoughts are probably garbage, but getting it into that final form is a, a rubric that I believe a lot of comedians follow. Some don't write, Russell famously does not write anything down. And some comedians don't, Sinbad comes to mind. There's some other historical ones as well. But for the most part, I always encourage people who are just starting out to write it out and then mark an L next to where you think people are going to laugh because you get up there and people aren't going to laugh if they know what you're talking about. That's just a premise. If they get what you're saying, that's a premise they're on board. But now you got to get him with a punchline, not a Will Smith punchline, but some kind of a punchline. <laughs> I'll let it go. I'll let it go. <laughs> So that was point two. So point one, uh, you said, uh, you know, write it down in your diary. You know, that was notebook one. Notebook two, you mentioned um, it's work in progress. And what's the point, uh, the third point that you mentioned? 
The third is the finalized form, what you're taking up there on stage and what seems to be working out after, you know, working it right. out on stage. A right. Few so times, you, you improv on the stage, what's working. And all right. So let me just ask you, you know, there, the, what from the answer that you gave it to me, uh, uh, you know, from the technical uh, aspect, what I understand is that there are two things. One, you're observing uh, the best and the finest in the industry, how they are making their presence felt on the stage, how they're performing, uh, their confidence, the, you know, how they're interacting with the viewers, that's one. Second is observing the normal people around you, you know, be it their mannerism, um, you know, their, how they're interacting, whatever they're doing, you know, and, and for you more so, you know, being, you being a funny Indian, of course, the soft target is the, uh, are the Indians. So let me just understand, how do you, how do you learn from the best and the finest and then put that together in your skill set on the stage? It's a great question, Vikas, because I think that is what we're learning to do all the time is you're trying to become yourself on stage the way that you are with your friends, right? So people watch you and maybe you're more amplified. It's a performance, right? You're not going to just talk to the audience right. like you're sitting around and just kind of like that. You can if that's intentionally what you're trying to do in a solo show, whatever. But right. for the most part, it's a performance. Pay, people came to see your finalized thoughts, not your raw thoughts. Right. And so you, you can, to some extent, maybe do an imitation or an impression of somebody, especially early on but eventually you find your own voice and louis ck rest in peace he said to a mutual friend of ours bonnie mcfarland you know when i found my voice everything became material and what he meant by that was once he found his point of view once he found his way of putting something they call that a turn of phrase just so you know there, there, a lot of we know a lot of funny people like this wherever they are on the gender spectrum we, as comedians we tend to refer to everybody as guys but you know whether it's a woman or a man or anywhere else you know we know a lot of funny guys out there and it's funny because the funniest people I know, they always say that comics say funny things and comedians say things funny, mm. right? So they're two different things. Something is funny on a page and some things are just funny like, oh man, they, they may not be able to like do stand up, but they can react to things and tear people down and really come after them and things like that. And that's why when people say you can't go after someone personally, I'm like, gosh, some of the funniest stuff I've heard my friends say is about my other friends. And it was really personal. Or they'll say something, they'll take the, take the mick out of me. And then you're just kind of like, man, that was so out of bounds, but you're laughing so hard at it because they just know you so well. And so I think it's people like that who have found their voice they can turn anything into material. It didn't matter. We knew this guy, Karthik, in high school. And, you know, he made some kind of off-color joke. I won't repeat it. I don't totally remember it. But I remember that my brothers told me this one girl in class was, you know, kind of offended. And she just said, you know, uh, Karthik, you always just make everything sexual. Everything with you is just sex and this and that. Yeah, anything I say to you, you can always twist it around. And I could say bread. And you'll just make that into some kind of sexual joke. And he goes, <laughs> and all he said to her, he just goes, Girl, what kind of bread you want, right? <laughs> and it's not even really a joke. It's not even really funny. If anybody else says it, you're just kind of like, but you got to hear the whole story. And Karthik was like, what kind of bread you want? It's not even sexual. But the way that he put things in real life right. is just funny. And it's hard to break down why that's funny, but it just is. Hilarious. Well, we'll take a short break over here. On the other side of the break, we've got some more interesting things to talk with you. We'll be right back after these messages. Rajiv, once again, welcome to the program, having some great, wonderful conversation with you. Listen, you are committed towards your craft, passionate, and, uh, you know, time and on, you know, you continue to research, continue to put your acts together. And you've certainly come a long way, as I said, you know, two decades is really a long time. I'm sure in the initial and in the beginning phase, you must have performed for the audience for free of cost. Today, you charge a whole lot of money to you know perform in front of the audience the question over here is you know if you were to describe your journey from where you started what you wanted to be as a stand up comedian how satisfactory is that feeling it is a great feeling. And it's funny that you mentioned starting off for free because the person I mentioned, Karthik, actually, his was the first paid gig I did. I did, I believe it was his high school graduation for $75. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. oh my gosh. It's funny, yeah, your, because your questions are great. It ties right in. You're just right there with me and your questions are so insightful. Jay-Z, the rapper on the East Coast or on the East Coast, talked about how he never performed for free. He felt like it was art and he should pay for it from the jump, even if it's a little bit. And right. I follow it's that It's entertainment. Model. You're entertaining viewers, you know? 
Absolutely. And so, you know, there are the people who took the, a different tack, which is they're going to get their stuff out there and get exposure, the big E word that we love to throw around exposure. But I felt like, no, it's not just for me. It's also for all the other artists, because if I devalue my work, I have a greater responsibility to the larger artistic and entertainment community as well, because then you're going to pull the price down. It's like if your neighbor sells their house for, you know, $100,000 less, like, oh, it's our house. We'll do whatever we want. Yeah, but right. you just ruined the comps for the rest of the neighborhood, man. Like, think <laughs> about what you're doing. That's, that's really important to keep in mind. So, look, honestly, there are some things that I have not achieved that still bother me. And I kind of go, wow, I can't believe I haven't done that yet. And that just really is really hard to take. But there are other things I've done that I never thought I would do. I never thought I would host the GQ India Awards, the Men of the Year Awards in Bombay. And Deepika Padukone is there and Saif is there and Karan Johar is there and all these people. Like they were front row watching me do stand-up comedy and laughing and applauding. And I'm on stage getting selfies with them. I'm not even a big Bollywood guy, but even I recognize the magnitude of that. I never thought I was going to be the first person ever to perform stand-up comedy on all seven continents. I didn't right. set out to do that originally. So I've done some really cool things, uh, but there's some things I haven't done and those hurt. But I think that you also look at it and go, look, this is the journey and you put the whole thing in perspective, right? I'm a boy from Ohio. I live in California. I own a plot of land in California. I'm married to a wonderful Gujarati woman. You know, I'm Punjabis and Gujaratis. That's one of my oldest jokes. I used to work at p and <laughs> I know. Punjabis I've heard that quite often, yeah. You've heard me do that joke. That's one of my oldest ones. I try to bring on 95% new material, but some of those ones, they're like, how come you didn't do that joke? I'm like, all right, right. fine, I'll do that joke. I do like it. I'm Punjabi and recently about Six weeks ago, Narendra Modi, India's Prime Minister, who's a, who's a fan of Modi Ji? We have fans of Modi Ji here tonight? Okay. He came to speak in San Jose, okay? And uh, they need, needed an opener, and they asked me. I actually got to do stand-up comedy, opening for Prime Minister Modi in front of 17,000 people, which was just a little smaller than tonight's event. And the thing is, because he's Gujarati and I'm Punjabi, I felt like I needed to do something to get closer to the Gujarati culture. So I got married three months ago to a Gujarati woman. You know, I'm married, I have a child now, I'm a father, I'm late to the game, but I'm so blessed to have Naveen in our lives and my parents are so happy, they're now grandparents. You put everything in perspective, the sun is shining, I have siblings, I have friends, everything. Your career is part of that journey. And some of the things that maybe you don't accomplish or won't accomplish, you can't let that get in the way of the fact that you get to do what you want to do with your life. And I get to speak with you, you know, right now, instead of having to work a desk job, that's a win. Well, it is a win-win. Let me just tell you, it's, it's a journey. And as long as you're in the game, you're in the journey, you know, there's always a possibility of achieving so much more. And all those wonderful events that you mentioned, you know, those are the events at your level, even at my level, when I get to do those, you know, those continue to motivate us to do a better job, you know, and that that's what allows us to be on our feet and continue to progress in our field and come up with some creative ideas. I want to ask you, um, you know, you are amongst one of those um, stand-up comedians who made it possible from, uh, you know, from the State Department over here that, uh, you know, four of you, you, Hari, and I guess there were two other stand-up comedians who had gone, uh, four of you individuals had gone um, to India. And I think the tour was called as Make Chai, Not War. Is that what it is? Um, yes. And, yes. And, and from there on, it sort of uh, became a trend. You know, thereafter, I saw many individuals, many stand-up comedians, although back, in the, back at that time, almost it's almost like a decade and a half or so, or over a decade, I think the stand-up comedy culture was just sort of coming up. It was just building up in India. It wasn't there. Now it is just all-time high. But, but what I'm saying is you guys took that culture from the West to the East, and, and that was trend setting. Uh, what was the whole experience like? It started from a real place. It started from the Asma, the soul, you know, and all of that, because my friend Azar Usman is a leading Muslim comedian. I'm a Hindu comedian, and we're really good friends. We laugh at the same jokes. We watch the same movies. We listen to the same music. I always joke about him that I, we agree on everything except for the final destination of our souls. And he is my brother at arms. And oh, my gosh. Now I remember where was the first time I heard Azar Usman was you and Rajiv, you were emceeing, and you had your own stand-up act. This was in Toronto, Canada at Masala Mehendi Mas 
nasty man. That was it. Now I remember Azhar was too good as well. That's where I met him. Dominant. That's where I met him. And I think we were both opening for Russell Peters, I believe. Or maybe that was another gig, but it was That was Toronto. another gig. But I thought okay. you guys were just phenomenal, man. Azhar was just too good. Yeah. So good. Uh, I will pass that along to him, and I'm sure he's probably watching this as well. But yeah, he's, <laughs> he's, uh, he's, he's an amazing guy. And, you know, he and I put this thing together. We toured around nine or 10 cities in the United States, D.C., New York, Chicago. I can't remember them. This is a long time ago. And then the U.S. State Department got a hold of us. And luckily, this is under Obama and not Bush or Trump. But they decided to send a couple of comedians to India, which sounds like the beginning of a joke. And they brought us back because it was Obama. Otherwise, Trump might have left us there. Who knows? But <laughs> at any rate, we took a long Hari Kondabolu, another Hindu comedian. And, you know, Paul Varghese had performed with us here who's Christian. And we had some right. atheists. And it was really just kind of a an all encompassing, whether it's Sikh or Jan or everybody we wanted to include as many Jewish, we had everybody that, that we could think of, as long as they were they see they were South Asian, we wanted to include them in, in that mix. But even still, we actually had Hannibal Burris, who was the one who out of the whole Bill Cosby story, he headlined our show in uh, Chicago, the Lakeshore Theater now. So it wasn't just South Asians, it's coming back to me now, we had some other folks on, on there as well, which is great. And he killed, I mean, he, he does such random humor and to just destroy with mostly an uncle auntie crowd it showed you his his skill set so we went to india we toured we had a great time and honestly you know the development of comedy in india i might be you know i have a lot of firsts and i think i think this is true that i'm the first person ever to do an hour of stand-up comedy in india and i think that is true because i did that in 2009 before it even started this is in right. uh bangalore and uh ub city i think it was the mall it was, it was like right in front of the Ferragabo store I'm like how are we gonna laugh here and then they set up all the chairs and i had to do an hour there was no one else there right. and there was no such thing as uh called a stand-up comedy at the time and now it has just exploded tables have turned around man it's just uh every other city and it's it's the the stand-up comedy whether it is in hindi or english it's happening all over whether it is uh, the metropolitan cities or whether the rural India, it's happening all over and it's just going incredible right now. And that, as a matter of fact, uh, is my next question to you. Uh, you've, after that, not, that was one of the, uh, you know, tour for you folks, but you've been to India after that several times, as you mentioned about, uh, you know, I'm seeing several prominent events in, back home in India, which of course had the presence of many, um, you know, mega stars uh, from, uh, from the world of Bollywood. Um, thereafter, it's sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, many people started uh, looking forward to performances such as yours and many other individuals um, uh, who were living in the West. Now, some of them actually moved to India and pursued their career and they now live in India. I know many individuals who were uh, on their work visas over here, you know, they quit their professional job and, you know, they wanted to pursue stand-up comedy. So they're back home in India and they're doing well for themselves. At any point of time, do you think that's happening because of the large population, the young population in India? And, you know, right now, India seems to be a good market for stand-up comedians. I think it's the work aspect as well as the life aspect. Yes, I, I agree that the marketplace is getting better. It's also that India now is, even if you grew up in the West, if I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, I could see myself, I, you know, it probably have to be Bandra, but I could live in India. You know, it, I would have said Bangalore before. The thing with Bangalore though, it, it was my favorite city in India, but the traffic is just out of control. It's insane. Like it takes you two hours. That's to in every Bangalore part of airport. the country, man. That's in oh, every part of India. Man. Popular place, and I understand why. The climate is even better than Los Angeles's. It's amazing. I love the south of India as well as the north I've been to, I think. I don't know how many states, 11 states I've performed in or something out of the 29 or 30 that there are. And so it was, uh, it's a livable place now. And you can, you know, I had been to India as a child and then several times as an adult. I, I gotta be honest, the first few times I went, I didn't like it. I mean, my my soul yearned for the East, my body craved the West. I just was not built for it. The first time I went <laughs> in 85, I was nine years old, giving away my age here, but I was dehydrated for six of the eight weeks that I went there. I almost died. I woke up one night so weak, I could not even move. So really? I couldn't hold anything down. My parents were terrified to take us back. And so that, sense memory of that held them back from taking us uh, to India every year. We didn't learn Hindi. We didn't do any of those things that a lot of our friends did because the mantra at the time was assimilation, right? It was 84 is my theory. If you're born in 84 or later in this country, then you know Hindi as well as probably your mother tongue of Punjabi or Tamil or any of them, Gujarati, et cetera. So now though, you know, things have evened out for the United States and India. And you can see people not just 
from India staying there, but people here going, oh, I could probably go live in India. And that is a statement you could not have made very easily 10 years ago. And so you go over there. The only thing is you're going to be competing with homegrown talent. And that's mm. hard because that's hard. I, I've seen Indians from India come perform at like Desi Comedy Fest and whatever. And American audiences, even white audiences, especially white audiences are very open very welcoming and they'll listen and they'll clap and they'll applaud they'll laugh a little bit but they're not gonna laugh as hard as the guy who can make those sweet home alabama references and who can go all in on a journey song or whatever their references are and it's the same thing you go over there they'll laugh at my stuff i do well I, i'm not going to say that but you get you get a person on there who can throw in some hindi punchlines and a little bit of punjabi and those are very intricate intricate details of the of the local culture it's going to be hard to compete with that. That That's even true here if you have a headliner going to a town where the MC right. is going to do all local jokes, even if they're both white, even if they're both black, whatever it is, that's hard to compete against. If you're going over there to India to try to like, oh, they're just going to eat me up because I'm American. Mm, I don't know that that's necessarily true. Well, that leads me to another question. I was actually about to take a break over here. But, you know, when you mentioned about uh, some headliners over here performing in, you know, if, if you were really going too local, let me just ask you this question. How do you see the positioning of South Asian stand-up comedians amongst the uh, mainstream uh, performers? The mainstream of the performers here in, in the United States? Correct. <clears throat> the way that I see South Asians on the mainstream landscape in America is very interesting. I think that we're collectively quite good. And what I mean by that is there, there's a lot of insight. There's a lot of humor. There's also, though, a lot of difference. There's a lot of variability. And if you look at Russell Peters, Aziz Ansari, Hassan Minhaj, my, my old roommate, uh, you know, all these people who are out there, Hari Kondabolu, and all the people that we've already covered as well, there's a lot of differences in points of view. And these folks are good at, they have good, good presence, good material, good delivery. Kamel Nanjiani, some of these folks who have really popped off. They're, they're, we're, we're good. We're right in there. Um, I think we're still waiting for that, like Bill Burr or that, you know, Chris Rock level. But those are some of the greatest guys in the game, right? I right. mean, like to get to that level, it's going right. to take a little bit of time, people who are, who are coming up here. But the performances that you see from, the, from these guys is, is every bit as good, if not better than a lot of their mainstream competitors. I'm Indian, just Indian. I'm not South Asian any more than Russians or North Asian. I'm not Asian Indian or East Indian. There are 1.3 billion of us. We don't need a cardinal direction, okay? It's not our fault that Christopher Columbus got lost. Sure, we love our states but there's strength in numbers. One out of every six human beings is Indian. So stop dividing us. The British already did that once. And we need to quit saying that we're not Indian because I wasn't born here or sound like this or eat that. Our hearts are Indian. We are feelers. We gave the world the romance of Bollywood films and the music of Ravi Shankar and Zubin Mehta and Lata Mangeshkar and Asha Bosle and the allure of the Kama Sutra. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a quick short break over here. On the other side of the break, we'll talk to Rajiv about his popular video that has captivated the attention of many viewers. It has crossed over 50 million views on YouTube. I am Indian. We'll talk about that after these messages. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching Focus Live. I'm Vikas Nangya. Ladies and gentlemen, today I am in conversation with the funny Indian Rajiv Satyal. Rajiv, once again, welcome to the program. In this segment, in the last segment, I want to talk to you about uh, your YouTube video, I Am Indian. What was the idea behind that? You know, it really got our attention all over, not just here in the United States among the Indian diaspora over here, but all across the globe. We are thinkers. We are great at math because we invented numbers. And we're pretty good at letters, too. We are doctors and engineers and techies. And we mean business. We are the world's third largest economy and the wealthiest ethnic group in America. We are huge and efficient. India is all on one time zone. That way everybody in the country is still late, but at the same time. We never invade anyone because we already have everything. Chess, the ruler, the button, wireless communication, arranged marriage, flush toilets, steel, democracy. All us, all India. I'm honored to be associated with it. You know, it's something that I don't even refer to as my video anymore. I refer to I Am Indian as our video because it traveled so well. And, you know, 
it, when you make something, you're hoping that it will resonate with other folks, but you know, you're always looking at concept writing, delivery, and production. And those four things have to align, whether it's a sketch or it's a monologue or it's a film or whatever it is, right? It's got to be conceptually good, which I believe that it was. I mean, I remember uh, submitting it to my director, who's Egyptian. And you wrote and it yourself? I wrote it myself. I wrote the entire wow. thing myself, but he kept pushing me. He's like, you know, the first draft of it, he goes, are you, what do you, do you work for Wikipedia now? I go, what do you mean? He goes, you just give me a bunch of facts. He goes, where's the dharam? Like, where's, where's your, like, I thought you Indian people had like all sorts of heart and soul that I was like, oh, right. maybe that's the way. It's like, we should do mind, heart, and soul. And that's, you know, that really unleashed it for me. And that's why it's more than have a good director, an outside view, maybe somebody they see, maybe somebody not who can look at you and go, well, here's my perception of India and they can help balance you a little bit, which is why with all my solo shows, I've tried to pick people. If I was doing something on dating, I want a female director. If I'm doing politics, I want someone who's white, maybe, you know, a little conservative. If I'm a little liberal, you want to balance it out a little so you have a good audience. So he kept pushing me till I had the script down the day of delivery in downtown LA. We delivered this and I think it was July of 2014 or whatever it was. And I did it 50 times. I had the whole thing memorized five, zero, 50 times, one for one for every million views it would get later, I guess, but something like that. And just, we kept getting coverage and angles and all of that stuff. And then the editing, and I think they did a brilliant job. Our, our cinematographer, uh, who's uh, Mexican actually, he's the one who like made it look dope as Hassan would always say, just make it look dope. He would always say that around the apartment. And that was the thing, just trying to get it all to come together. But it's so rare because I feel like if you make a 10 out of 10, which I believe that video is, you'll get 50, 100 million views, whatever. But if you make a nine, you might get a million. If you make an eight, you might get a hundred thousand and so on and so forth. So I've made 80 to hundred videos over the course, you know, of, of my career. And I made, I am American, I am Ohioan. And, you know, I was talking to my friend uh, from Ohio and he goes, your, I am American video is so good, but I have to be honest, it's not going to be like I am Indian. And I said, why is that? He right. goes, because in America, that's part of our thing is we thump our chest all the time because the, what's right. brilliant about your video. And he's a white guy saying it to a brown guy. He goes, you guys don't do that. And you should, you don't like take it all and put it into two minutes and 13 seconds and tell the world, this is why India is so great. He right. goes, that's why you were able to do it. And that's why it was so aspirational for your folks. I mean, as I said, it really made all of us proud. You put in some great uh, research behind that and put some facts together. I thought uh, I'm seeing another side of your personality, uh, you know, when you, uh, when you were, um, you know, acting in that video yourself. Um, should I say the commentary or should I say I saw it as more like uh, uh, you as rapping over there, you know? It was just, it was just incredible. Let me just ask you over here. The ordinary person out in the community was, uh, you know, everybody was proud of that video. What was the reaction of your parents? One of extreme pride and humility, right? They were just, I think they felt like, they've always been supportive from the, from the beginning, from the very beginning. But I think that really was like, wow, this is what it's all for, right? Because they would see the messages I would forward them. The most touching messages I would receive, the cuts are from, Parents who raised their children in America, especially those kids were that the kids were born here. And they said, you know, I showed your video to my child and it was the first time that they said, oh my gosh, I am Indian. And they were proud to be Indian. And they kind of accepted it and maybe they were picked on or whatever it was, but now they had something to go, oh my gosh, I have something I wish to be proud. And I'm choking up a little bit thinking about it because now I'm a dad and I know what that means, you know, for parents, for kids alike. So for my own parents to see that and read those messages and hear that from their friends and get it from their what in their WhatsApp groups and so many different WhatsApp groups. I think for them, it is really a special thing. And, and I, I, you know, but I have my parents to thank. I mean, they're the ones who instilled in the, those Indian values in me. So I'm American and they, they make no bones about that. Like your nationality is American, but your ethnicity is Indian and, you know, your dill and everything that you are comes from that from that place so i think for them to see it manifested in that way and to come back to them let's say like a boomerang because my dad's uh, brother lives in australia like a boomerang so many times around right i think it's been a really special journey for them great um and i also want to congratulate you for the success of your season one of your talk show uh i guess you're ready with the second season as well what's the lineup like 
Thanks so much. Yes, it's called What Do You Bring to the Table? We film it right here in my studio in Burbank, California. We built a studio specifically for this. We're really excited about it. And in you season know, one- and, have- and, and I want to tell to the viewers, you know, amongst the, the you know, backdrop wall of that uh, studio that Rajiv had built for himself, there's a picture up over there where he is like Mahatma Gandhi. Man, you look so much like uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And I I don't know what was the idea behind or who suggested you to come up with that uh, picture. Talk about that as well. You know, it's funny you say that. It's a white guy. Brian Patrick Mulligan, he does uh, these impressions of Dick Cheney and uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin and all that. And he looked at me and he goes, uh, I think you can make some money. So I'm on Cameo as Gandhi. And I put that in my Man in the Middle show where I was, a, I think, the first person to perform on Capitol Hill and all that stuff in my political show. But, you know, I, I like to come out as that. I think Gandhi is, is a unifying figure, someone that everybody knows and all that kind of stuff and tell jokes as Gandhi. I love that, of course, with all due respect. But someday I wish I, I wish I could interview. Maybe I should interview myself on my own show because in the first season we had Hassan Minaj, well, Deepak That would be a great concept, yeah. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be really cool. I should figure out a way. This is a good idea that we've hatched here. You need a good director like you. And uh, season two, we have Lily Singh. We have Karan Brar, Karan Soni, Avantika Vandanapu. We have uh, Parvesh China, Sujata Day, whose uh, film Definition Please came out. I just threw right. a birthday party. She was here along with Agam Darshi, who did Donkey Head. And we have a really exciting lineup. I don't want to give away all the names for two and hopefully three beyond. But you know, if they go to watchrajiv.com, they can see uh, season one. And we're going to include some clips for uh, season two. Well, this is incredible. You know, you've got some great lineup, individuals who are, you know, who've acted on stage, who performed on stage, and they've um, uh, performed in front of the camera. Um, Before I let you go, I I have two more questions for you. Now, your interaction with each one of them, you know, in some or the other way, maybe you've not asked the question up front, but you must have gathered some sense from them that what do they feel about uh, comedy as a serious business? Comedy is a serious business in the sense of, you know, even doing an interview like this, you're See, it means so tremendous good. preparation. And, you know, even though you're in good mood or not, but you've got to be, especially in the public appearance, you've got to be witty. You've got to be full of humor. Uh, all those things, you know, very, very important uh, for, for a stand-up comedian. It is really important. I mean, even in an interview like this, you're aware of like, how much am I being funny? Am I being too serious? Whatever right. else. But then people right. want to get to know you because if you're joking around all the whole time, they're like, oh, it was funny. We don't really get to know him. He was just joking around. He didn't really give us right. anything real. But then if you're too serious, people are like, well, so you got to strike that balance. And I, right. I hope that I do. And I think that we did. And so it is something that you're conscious of at all times. Even in real life, IRL, as the kids are saying, in real life, you're hearing that from people. Like, it's still important for you to be funny in your everyday life. And I believe that I am. My wife finds me funny. My parents, my brothers, <laughs> my friends find me funny. But I went through that period where you know a couple of years ago i was observing myself you just almost standing outside myself like a zen meditation kind of thing i was like am i still funny in real life or is it just on stage now and i was like no i'm still getting laughs i'm still getting <laughs> people to laugh that's important to me because you're only on stage on a good day one hour you're still off some, stage for some self hours. introspection was going on you got to do it like like jerry seinfeld said stand-up comedy is a journey into oneself so yourself is always present and i'm a funny guy and i'm glad i'm funny you know People like Zerna Garg, it, it was just such a pleasure to have her on because our banter, you'll see this in the episode, is just so good back and forth. You see two comedians riff from two di- very different points of view. In the first half of the interview, most of the interview is very funny, but then the second part of it gets serious. We talk about the great, and I use these terms very affectionately. I don't mean any offense. We talk about the great ABCD versus FOB divide. What mm-hmm. is it like if you're born in India versus born here and can the two cultures ever meet? Because I ran uh, a, a Basie Chain, which is a show on Facebook where we're trying to find in individuals based on if you knew them, right? So if it started in the Jewish community and they had somebody called the chosen one and two contestants would call people they knew within the Jewish community to try to find this person. And it was successful within the South Asian community as well, the basic community. But it was very hard to make the leap if there were two ABCDs playing and they were trying to find someone who was born and brought up in India, they couldn't make that leap. Their, their networks did not interact. They did not touch each other. And that to me was kind of a sad realization, but it was a, it was a learning as well. So, you know, you have all these people out there auditioning, Zarna, you know, Karan Soni, Karan Brar, Bra, 
sorry, Karan Brar doing all of these big things. It is a business because it's not just about being funny, but also right. it's about, you know, finding that within yourself, doing the right thing, going out for the right roles, getting the right representation. You know, that can really hold you back. And I mean, I, I, I would have talked about it too personally, but I feel like sometimes you can fall into a trap where you don't have the right team. You don't have the people pushing for you at the right moment. And right. that's what you'll hear in all those Oscar speeches a lot of time. People will say, hey, I was no more talented than my peers. I just got lucky. And for a long time, you'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, they're just saying that. But no, it's true. You see the people they, they know that are still doing local theater, local gigs, and you see them, you're like, oh, my gosh, they are just as good. And it's just a question of catching that break, man. Incredible. Rajiv, I want to wish you all the very best for your ongoing projects, for your future endeavors. It was a pleasure interacting with you. Thank you so much for joining us on Focus Live tonight. Kasai, I had a great time. Thank you for having me. All the best to you as well. Thank you so much. You stay safe and stay well, ladies and gentlemen. That brings us to the end of tonight's episode of Focus Live. Until next episode, stay focused, stay blessed. Good night.